This is a one terabyte hard drive, but the largest mathematical proof ever requires a crazy 2,000 of these hard drives just to fit the proof on it. A proof that would take a single CPU 14 years to be able to compute out the result. Thankfully, a supercomputer at the Texas Advanced Computing Center was able to use an enormous number of CPU cores all running in parallel to compute it out in a more practical three days. But the point is that for a proof this enormous, it raises lots of questions like what were they trying to solve and, and how did they actually construct such a proof? And perhaps most important of all, how do you verify the accuracy of such an enormous proof that's far beyond the scale where humans could ever verify it by hand? Thankfully, the actual paper by Howla is only nine pages. I'll, I'll link it down below if you would like to read along. But it tells a fascinating story about the interplay between mathematics and computers that I'm excited to share with you in this video. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them at the end of the video. Consider a bunch of integers, one, two, three, four, and so forth. If I try to color these integers with two different colors, you'll notice that I get a bunch of triples. Like, for example, there's the number one plus six equal to seven. All three of these numbers are the same color blue. Or if I take, say, two plus nine equal to 11. However, if instead of using two colors, I instead replaced it with three colors, then I can find a way where there is no A plus B equal to C that's all the same color. You can check. If you go through here, you'll never find three numbers for A plus B equal to C that are all the same color. And this immediately raises the question, like, here I've gone from 1 to 13. How big could I have gone before I was forced to have an A plus B equal to C? Well, to illustrate the idea, let's just look at the first five numbers. I've colored the first of them blue, could have been yellow, doesn't matter. And I'm going to imagine trying to use only two colors to cover these first five numbers. Now, if I think about the second location, the second location has to be yellow, otherwise I'd have the formula 1 plus 1 equal to 2. We'd have a monochromatic triple as my fancy way of describing it. Looking at 3 doesn't immediately give something, so I'm going to skip over to 4, where I notice that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, and that means that 4 has to be blue, otherwise I'd have a monochromatic triple of 3 yellows. Well, now I can go back down to 3 that I have this, 1 plus 3 equal to 4, the 3 has to be yellow to prevent a tripling of the same colors. And now if I go over to 5, something weird happens. Well, the first way to think about 5 is that it has to be blue because otherwise 2 plus 3 equal to 5 would all be yellow. But it has to be yellow because 1 plus 4 equals 5 and otherwise it would be all blue. And so the number 5 here is required to be both blue and yellow. This is impossible. So what I've argued to you is that for two colors, I could color four numbers and have none of these triples, but it's impossible to color five of them. And so now we have a definition. This is the sure number, which I'll denote S of K. K is the number of colors. And this S of K gives the largest integer N such that if you try to color the numbers one up to N with your K colors, that you would have no monochromatic solutions to the equation A plus B equal to C. So in effect, what I just proved to you is that S of two, the sure number for two colors is four. You could do it for four, but that you can't do it for five. It is impossible in the case when you have five numbers. The sure number for three colors is 13. I mean, this one is small enough that you could consider all the cases by hand if you wanted to, or you could program it quickly and find that, that indeed that it was impossible to get 14 appearing. Sure number four actually takes almost 50 years from when the original problem was posed to be able to compute. The complexity involved is enormous, but it was done and got the value of 44. But for sure number five, the value of it was unclear for over a century. In the 90s, it was found that you could color 160, and an example was found, but we didn't know whether you could color 161 or above. And then we also knew that it was finite. The original Schur's theorem says that this will always happen. There will be a finite answer to it. And that is part of a branch of mathematics called Ramsey theory. I've actually done a whole video on a bunch of cool Ramsey theory theorems and their proofs that you can go and check it out if you want to spear it for how those proofs kind of work. Loosely, I think of them all this way. It says, eventually, if it's large enough, some structure is guaranteed to occur. So in our case, if you have a large enough value of n, then 
a monochromatic solution to a plus b equal to c, that structure is guaranteed to occur. So there is a finite number, but what is it? And you might think, okay, well, we have supercomputers, right? They can crunch stuff. Why don't they just Bruce force calculate it out? But if I'm testing that 161 case, we knew there was an example for 160 that works. We don't know it for 161. Well, if we try and just brute force it with five colors, that's five options for each of 161 numbers. So that's five to the 161 possibilities. This is on the order of 10 to the 112 possible options. So, so this is staggeringly large, it's sort of beyond astronomically large. There's no way that our computers can possibly compute out all of the options. Brute force isn't going to work. And so here's our plan. What we're going to start is taking this problem and we're going to re-encode it. We're going to transform this problem into something called propositional logic. I'll explain that in a moment, but the idea is it's a translation issue. Then, when our problem is in propositional logic, what we're going to try to do is we're going to break this big problem into millions of smaller subproblems, And we can use computer algorithms called SAT solvers for satisfiability. And these incredibly powerful algorithms are able to look at all of these subproblems and compute a way whether or not there's going to be a solution. And indeed, this method works, but this paper can't be complete without the final step, which is to verify the proof. And we have to talk about how we can verify the proof in an example such as this one. So that's our plan of attack. Let's take propositional logic first. Quick review. Imagine I give an expression like this, maybe p or q and p or not q. p and q are Boolean variables that can be true or false. It might be something like this. Trevor is a YouTuber or Trevor is the president. To make this more compact, I'm going to use a couple different symbols here. We use this V-shaped symbol for or and this wedge-shaped symbol for and. And then for not, we put this little bar over top of our variable. So that's our shorthand for what we're doing. So now this expression will be sometimes true and sometimes false depending on the variables of p and q. And it turns out that if p is true, then this whole expression is true. Like if a statement p is true, then p or q is definitely true. Similarly, if p is true, then p or not q is going to be true. Turns out not to matter whether q is true. The whole thing is going to be true if p is true. And the fancy way of saying this is that I will say that the formula is satisfied. That is, when I assign p to be true and q can be anything, you plug those into this formula, the formula evaluates to true, it is satisfied. So that's our very brief review of propositional logic. Now I want to take our, our problem that we have, of coloring numbers, and translate it into one of propositional logic. So really when I think about what I was doing when I was encoding these numbers was that every single one of these numbers has a color, either blue or yellow in this first case, and also that there's no a plus b equal to c that has the same color. There's sort of these two different elements to it. You also might like to demand that every number has at most one color so that it results in being exactly one. I I'm going to ignore that now, just adds one more layer of complication. So I need to figure out how to express these two ideas using the formalism of propositional logic. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to create up a whole bunch of different variable names. So I'm going to call them pijs. The subscript i is going to represent the ith number and the superscript is going to refer to whatever the color is. So for example, something like p1b, that's my shorthand for coloring the first number blue. So if p1b is true, that means the first number is indeed colored true as it is in our example. So these variables are Boolean variables, they're either true or false. So the most basic level, the first thing I have to do is say that the first color is either blue or yellow. And so using my fancy variables, the way I can do this is an expression like this, p1b or p1y. The first number, that's the subscript, is either blue or yellow. Then I can say same kind of idea for the second number, right? p2b or p2y. Do the same for the third and do the same for the fourth. So these four clauses, the things in brackets I'll call a clause, represent saving each of the four numbers to one of the two different colors. Okay, now I gotta do the a plus b equal to c business. So the way I will assert that one plus one equal to two can't be all blue is to use negations in my clause. The bar on the top means not. So this expression reads that it is not true that the first number is blue or it's not true that the second number is blue. 
one of those two is going to have to be non-blue. For two colors, you could say, well, it would be equivalent just to assert that these things are yellow. But when you have many colors involved, it makes more sense to say it's not one color, which means it could be any of the other ones. So I'm going to go through and encode the other a plus b equal to c requirement. So for example, I know 1 plus 2 equal to 3 can't all be blue, so I put this extra clause in. I know that 1 plus 3 equal to 4 can't be all blue, and I know that 2 plus 2 equal to 4 can't be all blue. If all of these can't be blue, I can just sort of copy and paste all of them but make them yellow instead. All of those combinations of a plus b equal to c, they can't be all yellow. So this looks really messy, right? But the point is that this simple case with four numbers and two colors, I have encoded that with a whole bunch of different Boolean logic variables, and I have these combinations of OR statements and AND statements of my Boolean variables. Okay, so in our plan, we've done our first step, we've taken our problem, we've encoded it in propositional logic. Now, the reason we had encoded it in propositional logic is ultimately that we want to leverage the power of these incredible algorithms called SAT solvers or satisfiable solvers that are going to look at propositional formulas and spit out whether the propositional formula can or cannot be satisfied by some combination of the variables. And the easiest SAT solver is just to say, well, I have a whole bunch of variables. Each one can either be true or false. So why don't I just go and brute force it? I'll test the first variable, the second variable, the third variable. Well, if I have n variables, this gives me two to the n possibilities. And this exponential growth again means that this brute force approach is just way too inefficient. So let me give you a sense of how I can take this and break it up into smaller problems. Let me just assert for you that the first variable, p1b, is false. Now, if I just assert this problem, I'll notice that it appears a few different places. So if P1B is false, then the negation of P1B is true. So in these three locations, that's going to evaluate to true. And if you have true or another variable, those whole clauses evaluate out to true. And in fact, if those things are true, you have a bunch of and statements of trues, so you can just get rid of them. You can clean this up and get the smaller, shorter problem. I'll also know that if P1B is equal to false, I have, well, P1B written in second place in here. If this whole expression was true, since P1B is false, the only way for that to be the case is if P1Y is true. So I sort of already deduced that P1Y is supposed to be true. And that, al and that allows me to do two things. I mean, I can get rid of this first clause here. We know that's true, so we can eliminate it from the expression, make things a bit simpler. But now that I know that P1Y is true, well, I have all these negations of P1Y, so those are all false. And so in my OR statements, those can't be the things that make it true, and so we can clean it up and get rid of all of those P1Y negations. And, and I can keep going from here. But the point is that when I made that initial assertion, I went from a much larger propositional formula to a smaller one. Similarly, I could have asserted that the P1B was true instead. That's going to appear in a bunch of different locations. That's going to allow me to put in a bunch of trues, let me simplify my expression, and I could keep going from here as well. So the point is I've sort of divided my problem up into two places. I have this P1B is true, and I have this P1B is false, and it splits my larger problem into two problems, both of which were smaller than they were before. And then I could take these and, and subdivide more and more if I like. Now, the real question is how can we be smarter about the way we choose which variables to assign to be true or false. That is, how can we be smarter about the specific way that we choose to break up this problem into all of these smaller ones? For this, there's techniques called look-aheads. And basically a look-ahead is a heuristic argument for why some variables might be more effective at simplifying your large expressions than other variables and it tries to predict which variables are the more convenient ones. There's a bunch of existing look-aheads, but it turned out that if you use the existing ones in the literature, that this problem was still too large and would take many CPU decades to be able to compute out. And so one of the key innovations of our paper is to come up with a more refined look-ahead method. There's a fancy formula for it, but basically what it does is it takes every single clause in that really large expression and it assigns a weight to that clause. And the weight of that clause is higher if the clause is really, really short. 
Short expressions are nice because, for instance, if you just have one expression or another and one of them is known to be false, then the other one has to be true. So short expressions are easier to lock in answers. But also it assigns a lot of weight to clauses where the variables that occur in the clause are really common throughout the formula. So that if you sort of figure out that value in one spot, it's going to be helpful in a, a large number of places throughout the formula. So either way, there's this weighted look ahead method and it allows the author to subdivide this big problem into millions. Like I think it's actually nine million different sub problems. And there's some trade-offs here. You want to break this up into all of these millions of problems so that each individual problem can be run in parallel on a CPU core and can be solved quickly, maybe just in a minute or a few minutes. Some of the problems might remain hard and take hours to compute. This is actually where most of the size in the big file comes from, is the few remaining hard problems. You might think, well, why don't you just keep on splitting it up, splitting it up, splitting it up? But there's a trade-off. And the more computational power you spend on the splitting, the less computational power you have left for solving the problems. And so there's sort of an optimization and fine tuning of how much splitting of this large problem into small problems you want to do. All of this is done so that computationally, the final result is somewhat tractable. And indeed in this one, it took about 14 CPU years, but again, as I mentioned, many CPUs working in parallel, so it gets down to about three days of practical runtime to be able to compute out this large file. And it generates, this incredible two terabyte size proof along the way, proving it is not possible to color 161 numbers with five colors with no monochromatic A plus B equal to C's occurring. So you might think, okay, that's great. My, I put it in a computer, it's generated this file. How do we know that it's true? Like, how do we know that the proof is being satisfied? To be able to convince the mathematics community, you also have to do proof verification. Like there was a lot of steps that we've done that I've, you know, I've loosely outlined some of them in this video. For example, just one is to note that when you're dividing the problems and splitting it up, you know, assigning variables in different ways, you wanna make sure that you actually have checked every single possible case. What if you've missed one? Like what if your algorithms were designed in such a way that it misses some of the cases? So you have to verify that all of the cases actually were checked. So there's all of these proof checkers out these days. You might've heard of Lean, for example, which is a very popular one. This one was using ACL2. Either way, the, the role of these proof checkers is to verify the logical correctness of the proof. And what I find really interesting here is that the computational power to check the proof is on the same kind of order of magnitude as to create the proof itself. Like it was another, I think 15.6 CPU years of computation to verify that the proof that was generated was actually correct. Regardless, it was done and the result is now commonly accepted by the mathematics community. Now, if you want to actually get better at mathematics, then I'd strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons across mathematics, computer science, data science, AI, and more. What I really appreciate about Brilliant is that it puts you in the driver's seat where you are the one playing with the animations, making predictions, testing your understanding, and receiving feedback if you ever go wrong. This kind of active learning approach means that you are developing actual problem solving skills and understanding of the mathematics as opposed to just rote memorization for some test. Their lessons do a great job of building up complex topics like AI and layers so that by the time you've got to build your first neural network, you've understood every step along the way. And Brilliant makes it easy to learn a little bit every day on the go and the impact of regularly learning can add up to huge impact over time. As a math professor, I know that Brilliant's approach to active learning is really effective and that's why I am so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So to try everything they have for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet or click the link down in the description. And those who click the link will also get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.